I'll let you know that these recordings will be uh, available on Thursday. Everyone who's registered, we will send out um, an email with a link to these recordings. So you can look for those on Thursday. Uh, and before we, I turn it over to Nicoletta from EATG, who will be moderating this session with our wonderful speakers, um, Laurent and Sari. I wanted to just say a few quick words about the opening plenary at CROI last night. Um, so CROI kicked off last night. And as with um, opening plenaries at CROI, there is a special presentation um, named after Martin Delaney. So there's a Martin Delaney presentation that um, highlights community voices and community concerns. Our Martin Delaney speaker this year is the world-renowned global activist, human rights activist, LGBTQ activist, Frank Mugisha from Uganda, who was speaking about um, the terrible laws <clears throat> against gay people in Uganda and Ghana and the rest of the world, the homophobia that is creeping up and uh, intensifying really in every corner of the globe, including in no small part in the United States. And uh, there was sort of an appalling thing happened. Um, when Frank was introduced and was beginning to speak, many, 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 maybe hundreds of researchers left the plenary session. Frank was the last speaker, but they started to file out when he was yeah. beginning to speak. And that is um, both appalling and completely unacceptable that scientists at an HIV conference could not sit around for another 20 minutes to listen to one of the most important activists ever talking about some of the most important issues of our time, issues that directly impact many, many, many people who are impacted by HIV and AIDS. So this is a thousand percent unacceptable. It's completely appalling. And the community educator scholars uh, and I will be working on a statement that will be released um, coming soon. So we are not taking this sitting down, this lack of respect for community, this lack of respect for a, an important speaker who risks his life every day to do the work he's doing on behalf of queer people all over the world and, and really intersectional with um, the rights of women and other people who are often oppressed. Um, this is completely, it was really disconcerting and upsetting. So we're not letting that be unnoticed. So with that said, I'm going to get off my little soapbox here. It's not a little one, it's a big one. And we're going to keep the soapbox going, so stay tuned. But I'm going to now um, shift our attention. Today, we're going to be talking about social behavioral sciences, um, what we can expect to see in this category of science at CROI. And we're going to have a really uh, exciting conversation. I'm going to now turn it over to Nicoletta from EATG, European AIDS Treatment Group, who's moderating, and she will get us going. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you, Nicoletta, for working with us on this uh, session today. Go ahead, over to you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for for sharing with us what happened uh, yesterday. I think it's very important that as a community, we uh, we make a stand. My name is Dr. Nicoleta Polichek. Uh, I'm a social scientist. I'm a member of the European AIDS Treatment Group. I am a woman who's been living with HIV for 42 years. And that's how I want to start my very brief introduction by saying that it's very important that we contextualize HIV within society, within the space, which is not just a, a scientific uh, a medical space. I think it's very important as well that we take uh, um, not for granted that as social beings, we are intersexual social beings and there are so many determinants that make us who we are. And specifically, when we live with HIV, the social determinants are much more powerful, or rather, it's much more difficult for us to deconstruct them. But enough of me, and I think that uh, I'm looking very much forward to hear from uh, our two uh, speakers today, uh, who are going to introduce themselves in a second, so what they can share about the social behavior science that they've been tracking at CROI. Um, I need to, to say, um, 
although it's self explanatory in a way that if you have a question or you want to make a comment, you can either use the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat um, all the time. But also if you want to raise your hands and make a contribution, make sure that you unmute yourself by the same token, while our speakers are talking, it would be very kind if we all unmute ourselves so we can draw mm -hmm. full attention to them. I'm going to start by giving the floor to Leron first to introduce himself and then Sari. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Nicoletta. Uh, good morning. I am Leron Nelson. I'm a professor of nursing at Yale University, and uh, my research area is focused on, for the most part, finding ways to implement uh, the science uh, uh, that produces some of the strategies and products that have been used to treat and prevent HIV. Uh, I've been in social behavioral science for probably 20 years, and uh, I'm on a GROI program committee uh, on, in the implementation track. Uh, I look forward to our conversation this morning. Thank you. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Sari Reisner. My pronouns are he and him. Um, I am uh, trained as a social and psychiatric epidemiologist. Um, my uh, sort of roots uh, in terms of uh, science kind of come from a community-based setting, uh, largely um, operating in LGBTQ health center spaces through um, Fenway Health, which deeply informed um, my, my science and sort of integration of of how research happens in a clinical context, um, but also kind of like in a broader societal context. So I was in Boston for many years uh, in, in the US and recently uh, moved to Ann Arbor, the University of Michigan in epidemiology. I'm also on that program um, committee. And uh, yeah, just really looking forward to this conversation and wanna thank you, uh, Jim, for, for calling that out uh, about yesterday's, um, about yesterday's uh, speaker, thank you. Thank you. So can we start by opening the conversation and start uh, maybe sharing uh, uh, um, what is the impact of social and behavioral sciences on the understanding of HIV? Sure. Is that a question for us? I can, I can start. Uh, you yes, know, so please. one, yeah. you know, I had a, a chance to do this. Uh, they had this opening workshop for new investigators, and they part of what it is is to, to sort of give a preview or explanation of the CROI program for people who haven't been to CROI before, or folks who just want to get some orientation to it. And I think across each one of the the focus areas, cure, molecular, pediatric prevention that the the role or the need for more sort of social behavioral science and community integration was sort of spoken about. I don't think most people sort of could articulate exactly what, how it might work, except that some of the designs of maybe some of the, the trials that they've done, I think there was some admission that maybe they could have been better, you know, better designed and perhaps better outcomes if they had been more informed or driven by uh, what we know from social behavioral science, certainly the impact that for some of these has been a lot less extraordinary than we had all hoped. You know, the, the thought is that social behavioral science could have contributed a lot to figuring out ways to make this stuff work the way it should be working in terms of its impact on the community. Long acting injectable was sort of the, the poster child, if you will, of something that should be doing a lot more than it has and it just hasn't taken advantage of what we know from social behavioral science standpoint. So I think from the design element to how we actually can, I mean, how you design these strategies, products, devices, whatever, how you actually conduct trials, you know, what products are, are relevant or interesting to communities and actually how we translate that into real impact. I think that's the role, a role for social behavioral science across uh, every element that we're talking about at CROI. And I'm saying that particularly because I think it's, it's easier for us to think about it in prevention, but I think it's not just in prevention uh, that we should be thinking about and figuring out ways to incorporate this. And I think there's some some more appetite for it, maybe among the newer, there I say younger folks than the folks who've sort of you know been in you know at the forefront so far. 
but there's definitely a role for it. I think those are some of the ways. And I, I think uh, as as we get different sort of people with different energies into it, I think we'll find that there'll be more demand for it, and not just from the outside and not like not just from uh, the folks who usually find themselves on the fringes of Croy, but I think from folks who who are usually centered will will wake up and realize we're 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 uh, we're missing out because we're not collaborating and integrating social behavior science in what we're doing. So that's my initial thoughts on it. Yeah, I would I would echo uh, what Laurent said. You know, I mean, the HIV epidemic, the entire sort of epidemic, in is in context, right? It's it's not devoid of context, and then it's in the social world. It's in all of the social and structural factors that sort of shape the epidemic. It, it you know, so um, so not only kind of individuals, but but also the way that the science is done. You know, and you know, I think there's still this like sense of like what is there's a need to be sort of objective, and there is right. But are in terms of the science, but no, nothing is truly objective. Even the questions that are asked, the way that they're asked, the sort of designs that are utilized, there are already sort of theoretical and viewpoints about the world being implemented by that. Like for example, even if like I choose an individual randomized design, right? That's like a, a one orientation that I think would work at an individual level versus something like at the cluster level, right? Where I'm thinking, and I'm not I'm not prizing one over the other. I'm saying that sort of it's just important to kind of articulate the assumptions. And I think there really is um my sense is from some of yesterday's plenaries, you know, there the word equity was mentioned, you know, it was it was mentioned around vaccine equity my sense is that there's a sort of lack of uh, or a need for us to kind of really come together in the social behavioral sciences to, to say, how do we actually do that? A and what is equity? It's not just lip service, right? Um, so, you know, I think that there really is an ongoing recognition of without really understanding and addressing the um, multi-level determinants that are at play, the dynamics, the syndemics that are driving the HIV epidemic, we're not going to even be able to implement the technologies around cure and around prevention and around testing, right? So that's the piece that's missing. We can develop many, many, there are incredible technologies and I'm very confident and excited about, um, you know, the, bio, the, the, the biomedical pieces. You know, I think we need all the different pieces, but without the social behavioral, implementing those, you know, is the challenge, right? So I think there's a growing recognition that that partnership um, really needs to be happening. So yeah, I was very, um, so, so yeah, I'll leave, I'll leave it there. Yeah. I mean, even if you look at, at, you know, how we started and, you know, Jim's acknowledgement of what happened yesterday at Frank's talk, I mean, the Croy is a social context, right? I mean, we're talking about this is mm -hmm. what you do when you're at your site in your lab, but you could look at what happened yesterday uh, as sort of some evidence of whether or not scientists can be bothered with the topic right whether this whether they think this is, this is relevant to what they do a lot of people didn't think it was relevant enough to stay to listen to the talk i mean that is that's not a study that's the real life scientific context of the people who are in charge to find solutions to this epidemic this is how they this is how they think about this and and us and some of us and so i mean, i don't know how we study that but i think uh, the, the social behavioral element, to Sarah's point, everything is in context, but even how we do the work and how we talk about the work and how we organize ourselves around what our priorities is also in context. And I think that was just sort of a real life example of uh, what we, and I'm saying we as the scientific community, really think about the role of, of humans who aren't sort of in our labs uh, whether or not we think this has any real relevance, serious, important relevance to what we're doing. That's, and that's, that is, uh, I don't know, I feel like I want to say because I think we talk about social behavior science and studies. And uh, I think it's, we should sort of reflect on the way in which we actually show we don't give a shit about some about the things that matter, that should matter most. Yeah. Jim said we could talk like we're chatting with friends. I love that. I'm with you, Laurent. I'm so. I'm totally with you, and I completely <laughs> yes, agree. chat so, like we're friends. Yeah, yes. no, and I'm I'm completely I'm completely on board with that. You know, it's and I think that you know one of the great things, Laurent, is you know you and I, I think you, you we're both new program committee members this year. Um, you know, so I think that is sort of demonstrating a you know desire to really integrate this more. 
and bring that in. And I think that, you know, from, from my perspective, looking at the program this year, there is more content, you know, and there is content that, that I'm excited about, um, you know, that I think that, you know, hopefully we've, we've sort of helped bring to the, to the forefront, um, you know, so um, you know, maybe we can talk a bit about that. So there, there is content around stigma. Um, and one of the things that uh, struck me is, you know, that there's content around, you know, the, the need to not just understand HIV stigma, which is like a major piece. And there's, and there's great content around that, um, including some work um, looking at um, uh, HIV stigma in Beirut, Lebanon. So really like thinking about how can we look at these stigmas in different contexts, because of course they don't operate across all places the same way, right? Um, uh, uh, so things like that, there's uh, a, a piece around for me that I'm, I'm thinking of, or uh, one is around a sort of novel risk calculator, looking at sort of how to look at um, suboptimal, uh, suboptimal outcomes in a Kenyan setting. Um, and I, you know, they included stigma as part of that sort of measure, um, you know, so thinking about like, are there strategies that we can utilize that would sort of predict outcomes that are not sort of your usual cast of characters, you know, if you will. Um, there's some, some content on drug use stigma. So, you know, for me, um, you know, my background is in social and psychiatric epi, and I'm very interested in um, how mental health uh, substance use uh, and 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 sort of violence and those syndemics are driving sort of the epidemic. And that includes sort of these structural factors. And drug use stigma is a major factor, right? Um, we know that, um, you know, substance use does uh, impact um, HIV. I can tell you, um, you know, I know we have an embargo policy, so I'll just talk, you know, a lot of my interest is in transgender health and um, I've been conducting a study with colleagues at Johns Hopkins, um, with Andrea Wirtz and colleagues at Johns Hopkins called the LIGHT study. It's a study in the US of transgender women. Um, and we enrolled more than 1500 transgender women and we looked at seroconversion in the cohort. This is an NIH funded cohort. Um, and, you know, and we did find that you know, substance use was a major predictor, particularly you know, stimulant use um, of HIV incidents. You know? So thinking about what, what, is the, um, what do we need to address sort of like stigma associated with substance use? Um, and actually really like bring that conversation, which I think can be a hard one, into the forefront. Um, you know, I think there's also content on gender healthcare stigma, um, as well as like thinking through um, sex work, men who have sex with men and sex work stigma and how that um, impacts. So I think, you know, just in terms of even thinking about like the stigma that's operative, homophobia, transphobia, racism, you know, what, how does that, how does that manifest? So I think for me, that's an exciting thing that to, to see. And I was like, you know, going through the program, I was doing my thing where I'm like, Laurent, I'm like searching my keywords. You know what I mean? I'm like, let me find, I'm going to see how many times the word stigma appears in the program, you know, like doing my thing. And, and, you know, I was, it was more than I thought it was going to be. So I was very pleasantly like surprised about that. So I'm going to be quiet, but, but one like framing for me around this is like, I, I like to talk about is like, like the situated vulnerabilities in which people live. They're also like the, 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 all promoting factors too, right? Like it's not all negative and we're not all Debbie Downers here, but but like thinking about those situated vulnerabilities and for me, stigma is such a key driver uh, of, of much of it, particularly key populations. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I'll say too, uh, I appreciated seeing more uh, behavioral interventions and, and even more so structural interventions. I think I was also surprised uh, to the degree at which there were uh, a number of at least posters focused on talking about uh, understanding the way that structures marginalize people and make it difficult for them to be on PrEP or uh, stay in treatment. And that there was some work presented on ways that folks in the communities are looking at uh, addressing some of these structures and in some ways using multi-level strategies, so structural and behavioral. So I, I was happy to see that. I think the, the you know, what we could probably do better uh, is, making some more, uh, I guess I would call it airtime for some of it, because a lot of the things that were so interesting are in the poster sessions. And I think sometimes people, you know, they don't take poster sessions as, give them as much capital as the oral sessions, and they should. And I actually made a comment about that yesterday is, don't cheat yourself. Like a lot of what you want to see is in these posters, uh, but maybe uh, making some more, finding some ways to get some of this really to be talked about. Uh, and sort of a platform uh, scenario. But one of the things that is in at least in one, maybe two oral sessions is just focus on uh, 
displaced people and refugees uh, and what impact that has and what those experiences are and what they do for the ability to stay engaged in treatment and how people are navigating that. So that was definitely new. I remember, you know, uh, uh, the program committee really trying to think about ways to signal that. And I think that is, un it, it sounds like it was sort of unusual, but they really wanted to sort of make some space to talk about what's happening because there's so much displacement happening, climate related, you know, conflict related, uh, policy <laughs> related, uh, but it does have an impact and it's something that they really want to make some room for. So I was really happy to see that too. Yeah, I was as well. And the whole idea of what displacement is, like it's such a rich, like thinking about that as a concept, it's such a rich concept. I think it's one that we could really like unpack and really do a lot of work in. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of, um, I was recently, we we're working on a study in the Peruvian context um, and we enrolled a sample of young trans women. And one of the things that we were seeing was really a lot of migration um, and not just intra, you know, intra country within country, um, for example, from Iquitos and the jungle areas to Lima, right? So a lot of young women seeking opportunities, um, you know, having rejection from families, wanting to pursue their, you know, sort of gender, um, true selves and authentic selves um, moving within the country. But then also, of course, uh, within countries and particularly um, from the Venezuela, so the Venezuelan diaspora um, uh, into Peru. So I, I also, Laurent, have been very interested in thinking about, like, are there periods of sort of sensitive or critical periods in migration, you know, that are kind of a particular ones that we need to address and, and how do we get services to those communities that are really that are really in need. So thanks for lifting that up. Any any questions so far? I know you've been very busy on the chat. You yeah, there are comments. I mean, uh, specific questions. Yeah. I just wanted to jump in and encourage people. There's a lot of really great comments here. And ah, we see a hand raised. Yeah. Thank you, yes. Nita, for breaking the yeah. ice. Hi. So, so great conversations. I'm writing on the check, but I wanted to make three critical comments. The one is that we need to evolve ourselves as scientists because our language of science seems to indicate clinical medical. I'm in clinical trials for a long time in South Africa. And the second is I don't like the fact that we all, including myself, we kind of compartmentalize our language. So it's social behavioral science. And then what about community science? Because that's key, right? And social science needs to integrate with biomedical and, and uh, community science because community is, is a science and we're not letting that voice come through uh, in, in the publications because that's what's measured. And, and the third is that, you know, the PrEP fact trial recently, although the result of the efficacy was negative, but because the African-led consortium's trial uh, had a biomedical uh, study linked to behavioral work and community science, which had CAB members speak out at, uh, at an AVAC-led journal uh, session, and they spoke about how they felt about transparency and advocacy. And so I feel we need to begin to topple our heads, really, and challenge grants, challenge big funders, and indicate upfront that if this protocol doesn't have community and uh, social science, we're not gonna do this in the communities and how do we engage our CAB? So those are my uh, brave comments. Thank you. Thank you. I've got someone else who raised their hand. So please do go ahead. I can, Wakefield so it's S. Wakefield, yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, thank you all for, for this conversation. Let me say, just that one way we may try it amongst ourselves first to think about it and then carry it back. And so I will put it on Laurent and, and sorry to, to, to think about bringing it up in the closing meetings for Corey. It's a committee that for years has done everything it can to give lip service to community engagement. But Laurent, when you gave your talk yesterday toward the end, you had you had a slide where you showed both the model that you're using to do your work and summarize the rest of, of, of your talk in terms of bringing uh, translational science in and some of the questions that were asked afterwards. If you could share a little bit of that with us, I don't know if you even have access to that slide to share with the group, uh, because what I heard in that was 
that there's an ethos or, or even an ethical responsibility to do this work in a way that integrates the social and the translational sciences. It's no longer acceptable to think that we're going to get a biomedical answer and use communities to do that and not incorporate community science. So I'd like you to say a little bit more about what you said yesterday and uh, share that with the, those of us that are here this morning and didn't have a chance to hear you yesterday. Thank you. Well, let me, I'll, I'll share what I can remember from it. But uh, first, let me say to the first comment, uh, I think it was Nita that I, I agree. I think the the language of community science needs to be more intentional. I mean, even those of us who, who think a lot about it, I, I will admit that language doesn't come out. I think there's some, some, some impliedness about it, but I just assume it is. But I think it can be silencing in a way. And actually in my talk yesterday, somebody actually mentioned that. Did you mention all these other different groups, but you didn't say community. And I think we have to be clear about, about calling that out particularly so that it doesn't get lost and its importance is, is reinforced. Uh, Wakefield, I think what I was saying yesterday, I, I think I mentioned the HPTN study that I'm leading. Maybe that's what you're talking about. And saying that as much as we found ways and are trying to find ways to discover new you know, devices or products to prevent or treat HIV that they need to actually have impact. <laughs> And a lot of the focus has been on efficacy and not on impact and a way to make it have impact. And I think I use long acting and Jack, but as sort of, again, the, the example, because it's such a stark example of something that just has not worked in the, in real life as well as it could or should be working in this because we've not paid attention to a lot of these complexities that make it very difficult to do what this could do, seem to be done easily in a clinical trial. And that at least in HBT 096, uh, you know, the, the the basis of that work is community driven. The the ideas that we're advancing, community coalitions, making sort of accessible peer support to everybody, using social media to influence social norms around uh, stigma reduction, making healthcare clinics the target of intervention and not black gay men, because we're saying, well, they're not the problem. The problem is the context in which they're trying to get care. So that's a very complex study. And I'm not sure we could have done it if we didn't have, well, I can say this truthfully. Uh, I think it would not have gotten funded through the normal NIH channels. I think the fact that we're doing it in the context of the HPTN, the HIV Prevention Trials Network is sort of one way something that complex could be done. But we said, why, why would we tinker around with this? The community has told us what the needs are. So either we're gonna do it to, to have an impact or we're just going to do another study that's going to be fundable but it's not going to do anything for anybody uh the 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 so that that is an example i think of it and and even that study maybe i said this in another meeting like this you know that that study got funded because of community activism now we had to write a protocol it had to it had to pass scientific you know muster uh, but there was a lot of points along the way where the structures thought this is too complicated, it's too messy. What is this racism thing? How are you going to address racism? What a, stigma, LGBT? They just they didn't buy it. And it wasn't until community members made some phone calls and stirred up some trouble that they said, okay, we should give this uh, a shot. It's it's risky. It is a risky study. They have not done anything like this before. But if if we did, if we don't try this or didn't try this, I think we'll still be in the same situation. And so I was suggesting that we haven't figured out how we're going to work together, politics, political people, social scientists, culture folks, communities, but we got to figure it out. And at least in this example, this is us trying to figure out how we're going to work together to solve this problem. I think that could be a model for future research uh, but then it has to be sponsored, and I think uh, the community effort is going to what it's going to it's going to be what pushes government funders or private funders to respond to this type of thing. It won't just be the science, because if it was just us, I can tell you we wouldn't be doing the study. Uh, we don't scare, we don't people's jobs don't depend on what we say. But uh, when folks are worried about elections and budgets, you know, then it, we get responses. So I think that'll be available online for folks to see who didn't see it yesterday. 
uh, and it'll probably be more more coherent than what I just tried to offer you, but that's sort of my summary. Thank you for asking me to say that, Wakefield. Yeah, I, I just want to chime in and say, you know, the community sciences piece um, it is something, you know, I feel like I take it for granted. Of course, our work is community engaged from my in my you know space, but that is such a, a critical ingredient. And I'll, you know, lift up again the need for like communities to be just present and with us. And that also like those of us who are part of communities, you know, like, for example, like myself, I'm part of the transgender community, like we are doing this work too, right? So like trying to break down those silos, you know, around like who is community and how that functions. But I'll say also for the HIV Prevention Trials Network for HPTN 091, which is the first protocol specifically for transgender women, that's co-locating gender affirming care, um, including hormones for those who would like it with prep delivery, um, you know, that that was so heavily informed by community. Tonya Petit and I, he's the protocol co-chair, we went around to the five different sites and we beforehand got feedback and we advocated to change the design, you know, and that issue was, you know, we had a delayed condition. I, I think one question is always like, who's our control condition and what's the ethics of that? So we had a delayed condition, people immediately, and then six months later. And when we originally went to community, it was going to be nine or 12 months because we had gotten feedback you know, that, that we needed a longer period. And the community said, no way. Like, I don't know what's happening in a year in my life, right? Like, it's too far out. So, you know, just really like, and hearing, not just soliciting and getting the impact and being there and showing up for it, but integrating it. And that does take advocacy. It takes advocacy within the science community as well, right? And the funding community and so forth. So yeah, it's just it's such a great point. Yeah. It should be community sciences should be elevated as any other kind of science. It should be part of that. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for waiting patiently. No worries. Thank, thank you. you. You know, I think the scientific community has forgotten that it was community engagement, specifically community activism, that got this whole ball rolling. We would not be where we are without that. And it's been forgotten over the years. And even though they've kind of made community engagement part of the, the research networks that we fund, it's become uh, window dressing. They don't invest in it. You know, early on, people were literally dying to get on these committees and give their input. Now we have successful therapy, therapy people have lives, they have jobs. They can't invest the incredible amount of time it takes to set on protocol teams, um, you know, go to these meetings um, and do all this work without any remuneration with, uh, whatsoever. The ACTG is the largest clinical trials group in the world. They do not pay their uh, their global uh, CAB members or even the CSS members. And um, they don't invest in, in educating them and bringing people up to speed with the science as things have changed. And it's the same thing, sadly, with sociobehavioral research. They just recently um, incorporated that in, into the ACTG. And most of those researchers are expected to do so voluntarily, unlike the biomedical researchers. And that is shameful and needs to change. Thanks. I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very good point. Barbara? Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, so two things. To Nita's comment um, a while back, and I think people talking about how to change, how things are done. Um, and I know, you know, Jeannie Marazzo was sort of tentative about what she was saying. But on the other hand, there is an NIAID um, request for input. So I think we should probably all give input. But one of the things that I wanted to raise that was like very specific, um, while HPTN I think is great in a lot of ways, we are actually getting ready to do a study of the dual prevention pill, which is a single pill that combines um, PrEP and oral contraception. And when we proposed this study to HPTN, because no phase three trial is required, so really what we're trying to see is how to get this out there to the people who need it and would use it. So we wanted to include a counseling module so that we could test like how women in a family planning clinic would go in and be told about different methods and could then choose if they thought this method was right for them. We also want to include a part about um, providers and getting providers on board and seeing how providers felt about counseling about the different options. Anyway, of course, we were told this is way too complicated. Let's just focus on this randomized controlled trial where crossover study where people are gonna use 
the dual prevention pill for six months, and they're going to use two separate pills, prepping their oral contraceptive for six months, and then they get to choose, and let's see how adherence is. And it's like, okay, but you're missing the whole point here, because how do you know that the women who are enrolling in your study are going to want to use a pill and be okay about using a pill in the first place? So I don't, I would love input and help. I mean, I am like a tiny little person on this study. It's like, you know, way bigger than I am, but I just, I'm concerned that we're going to do this big study. Adherence is still going to be an issue because we aren't making sure that the women who are in the study are making a choice that they want to take a pill every day or two pills every day versus use a ring or long acting cab or whatever, um, or use injectable contraception and prep. I mean, it's just, it just seems like extremely short-sighted. We're going to spend a lot of money, not get the answers we want and throw the dual prevention pill out with the bath water. So any input would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, LeBron, LeBron and, and sorry, can you, can you help Barbara? Yeah, I mean, so I will say, you know, HB10 certainly is not immune to some of the issues that we're talking about, even though it offers some more possibilities than some, uh, it's definitely not a perfect, uh, for some of the work we want to do. I mean, I, I've seen that and I've experienced that. And, uh, what I would say, and we can talk more, you know, offline too, Barbara, is a lot of the way this HB10 works is through this, this committee, uh, system. And so although they invite, you know, anybody in anywhere in the world can submit something to HP10, it, it really has sort of a very elaborate administrative structure. Uh, and that's sort of kind of the ways to get, maybe it's political, but I think it is kind of who you can get to sort of be a champion and sort of help advance the idea. Uh, because it, it has to make sense to the people who get to, to green light the study. And that's sort of been our challenge is that it makes a lot of sense to me and it makes a lot of sense to Sari, but we aren't the decision makers on that that piece. And there's some folks that you can get to say, this is why we need to do it, who can really help uh, influence the folks who get to decide whether they do it the way that you propose, which is the way that's going to make the most difference. So that's, that's tough and it can take uh, years and so even as, as, you know, when Wakefield mentioned the study I'm doing and sorry, talked about his, the, I mean, it's it's not like you go to NIH and you write a grant and they review it and then you know you answer. Like this has been years in the making since the idea even came up. And so it's a, if you can get it, it can be great, but it's a long haul process. And I think being able to sort of articulate the issues like you just described and, and to connect with folks who can help with strategizing how you make the most of that structure, because it can work well if you can get it, if you can, if you can pull the right levers. But that that's been my experience, and I've done they're, this on three they're protocols. They're doing the study. They're doing the study. Oh, but they're not doing it how we suggested. They're doing it. They're they're just focused on comparing adherence between women who take this single dual prevention pill or two separate pills. Which and protocol so is it? It's HPTM 104. 104. Yeah. And so um, anyway, I have a poster, which I would love people to come by and chat about. About So we did a small pilot study using an over-encapsulated dual prevention pill in Zimbabwe with 30 women and very short, small study with three months on each regimen. There was no difference in adherence between the two regimens. So my fear is like, we're gonna get can the same just, sorry. results. And yeah, we should talk offline. Can I just, sorry, it's very interesting and I'm particularly interested in this topic, but I'm mindful that there are quite a lot of people still wanted to, to say something uh, and also because I'm mindful of time. So shall I move to Shikana Rose, please? Thank you, uh, Nicoletta. Uh, Shikina Rose here. Uh, I'm a trans woman living, surviving, and thriving now with HIV AIDS for 39 years. Um, I am really inspired by our conversations this morning. For the past two years, I've been actively engaged with 
a lot of different people around the country, whether it be the three Rust Bar Belt, uh, Rust, uh, the Rust Belt CFARs I'm involved in, uh, two state planning councils, a variety of coalitions, as well as um, community advisory boards. Um, this is what will, this is what's driving all of us to like create the picture to bring it all together. Um, it's taken a long time for um, my voice, other voices to be heard. And the one component that we haven't added that I wanna like bring into this space is trauma. You know, as advocates, we do a lot of work. Um, we've all experienced trauma in some way. And so trauma is a component into all of the work that we're doing. And it's multifaceted because like stigma, it has many variations and the, the experiences that people have are varied and important, um, not only to acknowledge and recognize, but to actually see. And it's often gone amiss in our communities, I find. And so moving on to another like observation, I'm currently involved in um, advocacy work, both uh, in HIV, human rights in East Africa, South Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, a little bit in Rwanda. And what I'm saying is that language, yes, I mean, we're uplifting it in a way right now that mm -hmm. is good for uh, the, global, the global north, but for other, the global south, language is actually... Um, uh, yeah, people are, 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 are hearing and are traumatized by language, but it's equating to violence. And so we need, as uh, LeBron and Sarah, I, I would like for us to all kind of consider how do we move past just language and deal with the violence part? Because it could like spread like the rest of like what we're experiencing in terms of um, homophobia and transmissia, um, it too eventually could come into our like consciousness that just addressing language in itself is great, but there may be a new avenue of what we need to look at to, uh, how do you want to like define it yet? Because it's too fresh. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Sorry, yeah, can they... I ask uh, to bring the other three people who are patiently waiting? Uh, yep, and then uh, if Baron and Sari can keep this, these are very important points. Thank you for raising them. She can. So I'm going to ask Karin. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you for everything that's been said uh, so far. And thank you, Laurent, for giving us a roadmap yesterday. But I think we also need to be thinking about the science that we're not hearing at COI. Um, there's a lot of biomedical research on HIV cure or HBV, but we're not hearing the social behavioral sciences aspects of it. Afama Koye gave a talk yesterday on HIV cure research, and social behavioral sciences was not mentioned as part of um, the roadmap and the strategy. So I think we have to be um, thinking about the social behavioral aspects of um, HIV cure research, particularly as treatment interruption trials are about to be scaled up in Africa. And the fact that there's incredibly limited formative research on this is very concerning. And as HIV cure trialists, we also need to be bridging with HIV prevention around partner protections. And as Shikina mentioned, we're going to need trauma-informed and healing-centered designs. And back to what Jeff Taylor was saying in terms of community engagement, the community engagement is not happening at the central level in the ACTG. But the, the basic science collaboratories, the Martin Delimi collaboratories, are mandated to have community engagement. So we need to bring community engagement into the networks as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask then JD and Candy to be brief in their comments or questions so then uh, Laron and Sari can have enough space and time to, to get back to us to you. Thank you. So JD first. Hi, I'm JD Davids, and I long ago was a member of the Community Liaison Subcommittee of CROI, and I'm so glad to see how much it has sort of expanded its impact and that we can use these kinds of technologies. I, I also just want to put a word in for people to urge CROI to stay hybrid because so many 
conferences and gatherings have gone back to in-person, which not only excludes many of us who are disabled or who have travel restrictions or are subject to travel violence um, because of our identities, but also um, subjects people to risk of ongoing COVID transmission. And um, uh, I, don't, I haven't seen the data yet that's going to be presented here and maybe locked out of a lot of it because it's on posters and the posters aren't really being uh, discussed with online participants. But we know that there's some evidence that long COVID is four times as likely in people living with HIV. And that means ongoing or permanent um, chronic illness and disability from SARS-CoV-2. So anyone who wants to talk about that, that's what I'm working on at Long COVID Justice. And the second thing is um, looking at sort of what's happening at other places in NIH, we see in the RECOVER study, which is a, um, uh, a large um, observational study about long COVID that's starting to do some limited, not great uh, treatment research, they pay people to be representatives. And I put in the chat this fair market calculator. I don't know that that's what they use at RECOVER, but I, I never saw that in, in over 30 years of HIV advocacy um, where there's there's recommendations and rates that people should be paid. But on the other hand, people don't have as much of a voice or say in the, in the research. Um, and um, there's not as much of a opportunity for people to, uh, there's not an emphasis on people being their own body of community representatives. They're more isolated from one another. So I think it's also helpful to look at what's happening in other places as far as um, uh, input into research and to um, be in solidarity with one another about what the best practices should be overall, um, drawing what we've seen as possible across different kinds of areas of study and networks. Thank you. Kennedy, please. Oh, thank you so much. Um, mine is just a, a, perhaps a comment. Um, from our observations from studies that um, are taking place, um, and also, uh, uh, like I wanted to take an example of the voice study. Uh, most, most of the things that we omit to take into consideration when we design these clinical trials uh, is that we there's one aspect, what is called the Maslow hierarchy of needs. Uh, you know, we need to incorporate this into the design of clinical trials and studies. Um, uh, I think this approach can uh, enhance participation uh, and recruitment and retention and ensure that studies are sensitive to the diverse circumstances and motivations of participants. I think it can also lead to a more engaged and cooperative, cooperative participants uh, result in a higher quality of data. And, and if beginning, uh, moving forward from now, we begin to incorporate the Maslow hierarchy of needs as we design these studies, I think, especially in Africa, because we, we take a study to a population which you, you, you take a product, a study product, and that community, actually, they are, they, 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 the needs of that community is, is not that pure, perhaps. It's another need. And that's the reason why perhaps we end up with uh, poor data at the end of the studies. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's for Laron and Sari to, to give us some sort of final comments uh, or summary of what we have said. And then I need, uh, I need you to be uh, short and sharp. So I need a couple of minutes. Well, uh, I can take a minute from the nine minutes remaining. Thank you. Solid on first, or Sari? Uh, okay, I'll say a few comments then. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I I, uh, I think you'll find at least those of you who can access the content here and in posters uh, more social behavior science content than in the past, uh, and we hope that we'll we'll increase that number and increase the diversity in ways in which social behavior science is presented at Croy. I, I think, you know, some of what you're saying, I know, Terry, and I will definitely take this back in our discussions with the program committee. And I think that, you know, part of what I think social behavior science can offer us, and that's based on some of what I'm hearing you say uh, this morning, is there's social behavior science can help us understand what's happening in real time as things are going along. And I think there's some ways that we could figure out that you, this trial is going to fail. I mean, I think that was Barbara's concern. Like, you, you can already kind of tell that there are certain things going on that if we don't do this, the chances of efficacy is going to be limited and it could be maximized. And I think that's the kind of language, hate to sort of say it that way, that 
they can understand that uh, if we if we stick to these current model where you design a trial and you stick that way, even if the folks can tell you it's failing and you can wait three years for it to fail, or you can do something now based on what we know uh, about the, what's happening in the community or people's interest in this. And so I think that could change one how research is done if scientists from Croy, all of us, you know, community scientists uh, and everyone champion it. Uh, uh, and if we can see more examples of that in future uh, meetings, but uh, I've been excited to have this discussion. I didn't get a chance to read the comments because I've been trying to pay attention to the, the discussion, but I hope to get a chance to read through some of that too. And anything I can do to be uh, useful or helpful, you can definitely reach out to me as a program committee member. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yeah, so um, this has been such an amazing um, process and everyone's comments are are just it just so inspiring and also thought provoking. So thank you for creating this space together. Um, you know, I was reminded as we're talking about, I, I'm going to lift up that piece about the community sciences again, and sort of um, treating that as a science um, and like bringing that forward. I think that's such an important piece. And also this idea, somebody commented on, uh, uh, on, on trauma and, um, you know, the need to take in a trauma informed approach. Um, you know, this is this is critical, and it's a larger aspect of of the context. Um, you know, in which HIV is happening, the epidemic is happening. Excuse me. <clears throat> you know, and one that we really do need to pay um, very close attention to. Um, you know, the ultimately for me, when I think about sort of how this scientific enterprise works, like we enroll people in research, right? Like so it is community. Without community, mm -hmm. there is no research. I mean, that doesn't happen, you know? So, you know, just like uh, as people are saying, I know I don't need to tell this audience, um, but but for me, sort of the community science is part of the social behavioral sciences. Um, so I just feel like that's such an important piece. Um, you know, Laurent, you mentioned this sort of idea of sort of failed trials, you know, and I think in some ways putting things in, in language that people can hear. Um, you know, I also think that like, you know, in some cases, there's so many lessons that we can learn, even in quote unquote failed trials, right? You know, and I think that piece of like understanding what works as well as what doesn't work is going to be really key. And, um, you know, understanding like when there is, for example, slow uptake of long acting injectables, like why, right? You know, and sort of like really kind of coming up innovating creative solutions together. So, you know, from, from my perspective, I, Lorana, I, I hope, I think you are too, I, from the program committee, I'm, you know, excited to be part of this process and I hope that we can, you know, continue to move the needle and add content um, and um, work with, with, with you all and know that we have a community here. We have 130 people or whatever on here who are, are interested in this, in this area and want to lift this up. So, um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. And uh, I have uh, five minutes left uh, and I'm going to take a, a couple of uh, minutes just to thank everyone uh, for being part of this uh, interesting and thought-provoking conversation. We are leaving uh, today thinking uh, that, again, the importance of social and behavioral sciences in, in mapping uh, what is the experience of HIV, but also in terms of thinking about how um, you know we spoke about trauma, vulnerability. We spoke about violence. Uh, we spoke of the necessity of remaining culturally sensitive, uh, but also contextually relevant. Uh, we want and we need uh, as communities to engage diverse population uh, with us, uh, and in order for us to to make sure that there are uh, long-term behavioral changes, we all have to work together because we are community, irrespectively of who we are in, um, in a paradigm, we are community and we can all work together. Um, before Jim gets really cross with me, I'm gonna say again, a big thank you to everyone. And uh, I didn't have the chance to read uh, all the comments, but some of the comments I read are really very positive and encouraging. So let's use this opportunity as a stepping stone, as a starting point to really, as I said, make sure that we are community and we continue to be community from now on. Thank you, everyone. And now the floor is to Jim. Thank you, Nicoletta. Well, first of all, there's no way I could be cross with you. You did a beautiful job moderating this very robust and raucous discussion. I can't, I'm emotional because this is better than anything I could. I, I wanted, the, I, I dreamt of something like this and this blows it all away. 
So thank you to you, Nicoletta. Thank you to you, Laurent, to you, Siri, to everyone who has made comments, to this chat that is blowing up. I can't keep track of it. And that's been my job today and I can't do it. We will be saving this all. We will share it in, in conjunction with the recording so people can go back and read through all this. Um, I did put in the chat at one point, like a million messages ago, that it seems like we might need to keep this conversation going. And so I would love, I, I run for AVAC, a, a, a platform called The Choice Agenda. We do webinars once or twice a month. We have a very active listserv. I would love to bring this to a 90 minute webinar, which we typically do with the choice agenda. So I'm gonna be reaching out to folks to lure you into that web. Clearly we need to keep this conversation going. And you know, maybe this is something we do on the regular until we really, um, well, as long as it takes, right? Until as long as it takes, because silence is not an option here. And so I'm just really, really excited for how this first Community Breakfast Club kicked off today. Thank you all for making it so amazing. Um, we will be back tomorrow morning. We're gonna be talking about um, living with HIV for a lifetime, whether you're a long-term survivor or you're someone born with it. Super interesting conversation. We really hope you will be there. Um, and then uh, on Wednesday, we have a panel of folks, um, both sort of seasoned and fresher takes on the science at Croy, People will be talking about what's really moved them, what's important, what they're gonna be following up on. And so I hope you will come for all these days. Again, all the recordings will be available on Thursday, including things like this amazing comments. Um, it is now one minute two. And for folks who are here in Denver, it's time to put on your roller skates and head over to the convention center, the big blue bear, and get your seat and um, start with the plenary. I'll see you all hopefully in the halls. And finally, I'll say, look for the, the statement from the community educator scholars regarding the appalling behavior of hundreds of scientists last night who walked out on Frank Mugisha's talk for the Martin Delaney presentation. We will not let that go unnoticed or unchecked. Uh, so pay attention for that. Lots going on. Um, the, the time is now clicking over to the top of the hour, so I'm going to officially say, see you later, and see you all in the halls, and, and I'll be online. Hopefully, we'll see you back um, at the same place, same time tomorrow. I opened the room a little early and, and have a playlist going because I'm a DJ in my other life, so please come bring tips for the DJ, and we'll see you all really soon. Ciao. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Au revoir. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.